Good morning. I'm Lane Sattler, one of the elders at Hilltown. In recognition of Labor Day tomorrow, our passage is from Colossians 3.23. Uh, that's on page 974 in the Pew Bible. Uh, you could mark that in your Bibles. Uh, we'll be coming back to it from time to time, but I, I will warn you ahead of time, we're going to be touching on a lot of other scriptures because work is a huge uh, component of God's scriptures. Uh, certainly we're not going to attack at all, but I will be bouncing around, and if you want a list of those passages, just ask me afterward and I can send them to you. So, let's get started. What is work? Why do you work? How would your children answer that question? Are your works good? What makes them good? Why is work difficult at times? Do you find satisfaction in your work? So we hope to look at all those topics as we go through this. So to the definition, what is work? Work is defined as activity involving mental or physical effort done in order to achieve a purpose or a result. Work includes our vocation or profession, work as an employee, working for yourself, work to care for and raise your family, to care for your home and community, schoolwork, use of your gifts to accomplish the great commission of making disciples of all nations and others. This brings us to point one, why do we work? Is this some grand conspiracy to keep us busy? Is this a necessary evil? We work, point one, we work because God works. As recorded in Genesis 1, God made the world in six days. Later, when confronted with the Pharisees' accusations of working on the Sabbath, Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working, John 5, 17. So God is working. He worked at creation. He continues to sustain us by his power. He's working out his plan in each of our own lives. And he, is a, and, and, he, and he is preparing a place for his own in heaven. Not only did God work, but God made us in his image. Continuing in Genesis 1, we read, verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So God created man in his own image. Being made in God's image means that he imparted aspects of his own nature in us, which includes creative abilities, work, love, and many others. So we work because he works. Furthermore, God gave us a work to do, a very specific work. After he created man and woman, he blessed them and gave what we call the creation mandate. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every live, living thing that moves on the earth. We were given the responsibility to work the garden provide for the growth of mankind, reproduce, and fill the earth. This would have involved all activities for building nuclear and extended families, communities, tribes, etc. God concludes Genesis 1 at the end of day 6 with, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So why do we work? Because at creation, God worked. He made us in his image and assigned us a magnificent work and declared it all very good. One could conclude that God was satisfied with his work. We'll talk about satisfaction later. But how did that all turn out? Have we been fulfilling his crea creation mandate? Are we good? Is our work good? Well, you know what happened. Point two, the fall made work difficult. Man wanted to be like God and would not obey, obey one simple command. Thus, all that was good was corrupted. And in his judgment, God exiled man from the Garden of Eden, 
Eden with these words. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In your, ch in your pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Genesis 3, 16 through 19. As a result of the fall, the entirety of nature was corrupted. As Paul notes in Romans, for the creation was subjected to futility, Romans 8, 20. Consequently, the work of men and women became much more difficult. It also reflect, affected our relationships, making them more difficult. We still have the creation mandate, but it is difficult. So in summary, for point two, our sin made good work and all work more difficult. This brings us to point three. Good work requires the right attitude. When Paul addressed believers about how they should regard work in the context of Roman society, as much as, uh, as half of the population were slaves. It is in this context that we find our text for today. To, to, for today. Slaves, obey those who are your human masters in everything, not with eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord and not for people. Oh boy. Knowing that it is from the Lord that you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Colossians 3, 22 through 24 again. Paul provides a perspective, an attitude that gives us to a, a way to make even the most difficult work redeeming and good. It is a principle that Paul consistently applied to himself, introducing himself in his letters as the bondservant of Jesus Christ. This attitude did not originate with Paul, but Jesus himself, we read in Philippians 2, who though he was God, emptied himself taking on the form of a bondservant. The attitude is this. We should work as for the Lord even when the conditions are tough, and certainly when they're not. We should work as so as to please him. So whether it is a difficult boss, a difficult customer, a difficult spouse, a difficult teacher, a difficult coach, a parent who you think is difficult, a difficult person we serve at church, we should work as for the Lord and not for them. Then our works will be good, for they show our love for God. One note of caution. Doing good works does not guarantee ease or immediate success. Many assume, as I once did, that because you do the right things, choose a noble path, or do something God specifically led you to do, that your task will be easy and trouble-free. Ever get yourself there? Such a notion is a lie of the devil and has led many to falsely fear in times of difficulty that God is not happy with them. Did Joseph, Daniel, David, and Jesus have easy lives? Were they not doing the will of God? Was God not pleased with them? Of course not. He was very pleased, even though they're, and maybe because their lives were very difficult. We should recognize difficulties as God's good work in our own lives, shaping us into his image. We'll get to that more later. So point three, good works require the right attitude, that of working for the Lord. Such work shows God and the world our love for God, especially when we do it in difficulty. 
Next, we will look at point four. Biblical objectives for good work. What, what work should we be doing? First, good works provide our daily needs. Paul elaborates for the Thessalonians. For, for even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now we command and exhort such persons in the Lord Jesus Christ to work peacefully and eat their own bread. 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 through 12. Likewise from Proverbs, a worker's appetite works for him, for his hunger urges him on. Proverbs 16, 26 and 27. And again, Paul, this time to Timothy. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for the members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. 1 Timothy 5, 8. God makes it clear that we are to provide for ourselves and our families. Objective two, good works provide for generosity. From Paul to the Ephesians, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need, Ephesians 4, 28. Our work should not only provide for our own needs, but yield sufficient extra for those in need. When Paul was encouraging the Corinthians in their preparation of a gift to the believers being persecuted in Jerusalem, he used an agricultural, agricultural analogy to explain God's, God's economy of generosity. Quoting, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully Fully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, He has freely distributed freely, He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. It's 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 11. Paul adds instructions to Timothy as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Thus storing up treasures for themselves is a good foundation for the future so they may take hold of what is truly life. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. Pro Prover <clears throat> Proverbs, which I'm going to quote quite a bit, and reinforces Paul's explanation regarding generosity. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Proverbs eleven twenty four. And again... One who is generous will be blessed because he gives some of his food to the poor, Proverbs 22, 9. So good works provide for cheerful giving, which yields an eternal treasure, treasure for the giver. The third objective, good works provide for future needs. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous, Proverbs 13, 22. Here and elsewhere, we read how those who honor the, honor the Lord have sufficient for future needs. The fourth objective, and maybe the most important, good works build up the body 
of Christ through the exercise of our gifts. Quoting Paul again, Now there are, are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries, but the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. We are called to use our spiritual gifts for the benefit of the church, to fulfill the great commission of making disciples here and around the world, and for supplying the needs of our, of our members. That should include material and financial support through our tithes and offerings. The subject tithes and offerings um, would take more time than we have, so I'll leave it at that, but maybe some, somebody can cover that another time. The scriptures provide four major objectives are, of our good work, providing for our own needs and those of our family, generosity, reserves for the future, and building our church. When done wisely and with a proper attitude, they demonstrate our love for God and also practically show love for our family and the church community. Next, we will consider four disciplines necessary for good works. The first discipline is diligence. For our young folks, diligence, keeping at it, doing it consistently, persevering. Diligence is a common theme in Proverbs. And I quote, The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in the harvest is a son who brings shame. Proverbs 10, 3 and 5, through 5. And diligent hands will rule, but laziness ends in forced labor. 12, 24. And in all toil there is profit, but mere talk tends only to poverty, 14.23. The following two problems, proverbs come to my mind when I am tempted by the billion-dollar Powerball jackpot or when I see ads promising quick profits. Those who work the land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no sense, Proverb 12.11. And an inheritance gained hastily in the beginning will not be blessed in the end, Proverbs 20, 21. The next proverb uses a quaint term, the sluggard, someone who moves slowly like a slug or a sloth. The sluggard says, there is a lion in the road. There is a lion in the streets. As a door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard on his bed. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish. It wears him out to bring it back to his mouth. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men, men who can give an answer sensibly. Proverbs 26, 13 through 16. Note that the sluggard is not only amazingly lazy, but he lets improbable fears paralyze him, and he deceives himself into thinking that he is wiser than other. So discipline number one, be diligent. Don't be a lazy, don't be lazy, or a sluggard. Who wants to be called a sluggard? The second discipline for work, good work, is planning. The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance. But everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. Additionally, we see wise planning requires counsel. Without counsel, plans fail. But with many counselors, there is victory. Proverbs 15, 22. Wise planning does not end with planning and, and counsel. It must come with humility and submission to God. Three times in Proverbs chapter 16, God refers to our plans, but tells us that it is his will that determines their path and their success. Verse 1, the plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Verse 3, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Verse 9, 
The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. James, the brother of our Lord, elaborates. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. James 4, 13 through 17. Planning, counsel, a humble spirit, and submission to God are important not only at the beginning of an endeavor, but throughout. Circumstances change, new information comes to light, unexpected problems crop up. We are living after the fall. Each calls for reassessment and a willingness to change course. The book of Acts provides an example from Paul's second missionary journey. Twice God blocked Paul's plans for going into Asia, what we call modern-day Turkey, finally revealing to Paul in a vision that they should instead go to Macedonia, Acts 16, 6 through 10. The third discipline is excellence the practice of doing your work well. The Bible emphasizes the importance of excelling at a skill. Do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men, Proverbs 22, 29. As an example, Moses sought skilled artisans when he had the tabernacle built. Quoting, now Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah, made everything that the Lord had commanded Moses. With him was Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, an engraver, and a skilled embroiderer, and a weaver in violet and purple, and in scarlet material and fine linen. Exodus 38, 22 through 24. After the Babylonian captivity, when the ruler Cyrus sent Jews back to Israel, led by Ezra, we read, So this Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all he requested, because the hand of the Lord his God was upon him. Ezra 7, 6. So we see he was skilled in the law. Joseph and Daniel were promoted because of their skills, and especially because they had the gift of interpreting dreams. Not that I expect you to have that. As you read the scriptures, you will see others noted for their skill. The fourth discipline is contentment. In the same chapter to Timothy noted previously regarding the rich, Paul writes, but godliness actually is a mean of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierce themselves with many griefs. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10. Proverbs made the same point 900 years earlier. Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Stop dwelling upon it. When you, see, when you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle that flies toward the heavens. Proverbs 23, 4 and 5. So we have four disciplines for good works. Diligence, planning, excellent, and contentment. The next point, good work is satisfying. We should find good work satisfying. Satisfaction is easy to see when you finish painting a room or setting the table or dressing for school. It may take more reflection and patience when you're trying to learn piano, to teach a child manners, obedience, and respect, or if you work on an assembly line where each day is no different than the one before. For the children, I have a question. Have you ever had an infant brother or sister at home? What can they do for themselves? Yeah, pretty much nothing. They must be fed, dressed, changed, carried, bathed, burped, and cuddled. 
They cannot even lift their heads, but gradually they learn. They learn to hold up their head, to smile, to put their fist in their mouth, to roll over, grab things with their hand, sit, put food in their mouth, crawl, walk, and talk. Have you ever noticed as they get older that sometimes they don't want to be helped? Maybe like when they're putting on their shoes. They say, no, do it myself. Do it self, as one of my grandchildren say. Have you ever said that? Why? Does it make you feel good that you can do something yourself? Yes, that is a feeling of pride, success, or satisfaction in doing something. Why do you have those feelings? Because God made you in his image. He made you to work, to be creative, to do things for yourself, to help. He made you so that you find joy or satisfaction in that effort. That is what I mean when I say that good works are satisfying. When Solomon pursued the meaning of life in Ecclesiastes, one of his conclusions was, there is nothing better for a person that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to one who pleases him, God has given wisdom, knowledge, and joy. But to the sinner, those who, don't, who reject him, he has given the business of gathering and collecting only to, do, to give to one who pleases God. Ecclesiastes 2.24 and following. Solomon points out satisfaction from toil. But no, true joy is reserved for those who please God. So when you have your Labor Day picnic, find enjoyment in your good work that provides it. Good work should be satisfying because we do them for the Lord. Point seven, good works require rest. God rested on day seven after completing his creation work and called Israel to do the same on the Sabbath under the law of Moses. A discussion of rest is incomplete without addressing the Sabbath, God's gift to man to remind us that he will provide. We do not have time to address this topic properly, but we must cherish the principle of rest. In Psalm 127 we read, Unless the Lord builds the house, those, labor in, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. The first verse addresses home and community. Building and maintaining a home is a lifelong task and subject to many failings. Keeping watch at night is often cited as a most tiring activity. You cannot wait for morning. And who knows what danger you might not see. These verses have been divine encouragement for me. When you have done all that you can do, when you have run out of time, when you have no energy, put your work in God's hand and rest. He gives us sleep. He will work in our sleep. I have had him clarify issues when I awake in the middle of the night. Some mornings I discover issues have been resolved. Other mornings the anxiety that had been building was replaced with a peace and a clear direction of what needed to be done. So wrapping up point seven, good works need rest. And now our last point, good works are evidence of our faith. There have been many messages from this pulpit that emphasize that salvation is not by our good works but by faith. We heard one recently from Habakkuk, from Habakkuk chapter 2. Usually these messages quote Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And so it is. But verses 8 and 9 are followed by verse 10, which could have been the passage for today's message. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, 
which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. Our good works are the natural and proper response to the great salvation we have received. God has given us a new heart and empowered us with the Holy Spirit so that we can participate in the great work and plan of God. The Greek word for workmanship, the workmanship that God is doing, is poema, from which we get the word poem. Each of us is a unique poem that God is writing in our lives, expressing his glory through our deeds. What poem is God writing in your life? So in review, point one, we work because God works. Point two, good works are difficult. Point three, good work requires the right attitude. Point four, good work requires the right priorities, and we looked at four of them. Good work requires discipline, and we looked at four of those. Good work is satisfying, good work needs rest, and good works are evidence of faith. So once more for our passage. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord and not for people, knowing that it is from the Lord you will receive the reward of inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. If you are a believer, be encouraged. You were made in God's image and thus made for work. Work was good for the, from the beginning, even in, in Eden's perfect state. Though the fall has frustrated this work, God continues to call and empower you for good works. Take satisfaction and find, and find joy in what he is calling you to do. There is a reward for our good works. The scriptures supply extensive guidance about work and wise living. Seek it out. Start with Proverbs, but do not neglect the rest of the Bible. If you believe but, not have, but have not taken seriously the need, the joys, the benefits of honoring and glorifying the Lord with good works, today is the day to change course. Seek the Spirit's power and start working as unto the Lord. If you think you are doing good works, but do not have this faith that Jesus is the Son of God, gave his life to sinners, was raised to eternal life, and is preparing a place for you, if you have not believed in him as Lord and Savior, your works are not of eternal benefit, nor do you have the Spirit's power to do them joyfully in a manner that pleases the Lord. Now is the time to put your faith in him. God is calling you. If you have questions, come and talk to me or any elder or the mem any other of the members here. Let's pray. God Almighty, make your word effective in the hearts of those here. Fill them with your joy in their service. Bring them who don't know you into your kingdom. Thank you for your mighty working of the Holy Spirit through the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.